I'm not handing over this stick to you. You know, you, you step to me, you got physical with me, I'm protecting my family. Hey, what's going on? Welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 258. And today, we're welcoming Shifu Chris Friedman to the show. If you're new to what we do here, you can check out all of our episodes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We release episodes twice every week. On Mondays, we put out an interview with an interesting or famous or, honestly, an average martial artist. Because we're trying to showcase that regardless of what you train in, where you come from, and the differences that we have, we all have much more in common than we do separate. And I, and so many of you, take a lot of inspiration from those similarities. On Thursdays, of course, we have topic-driven shows, and we're always looking for suggestions from you as to what you want to hear me talking about. Sometimes it's not just me. Sometimes we bring in other folks on those Thursday episodes. It's really your opportunity to help guide the show and have some say in what we're talking about. Here we are a minute in. I haven't even introduced myself. I apologize. My name is Jeremy. Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder of Whistlekick Sparring Gear and Apparel. You can check out all the stuff we make at whistlekick.com. And I'm the lucky guy that gets to interview all of these amazing martial artists and make talking about martial arts a huge part of my job. Talk about lucky, right? I mean, awesome. Can't believe it. Here we are, hot on the heels of 2018. In fact, when you listen to this, it's going to be 2018. As I'm recording it, it's just a bit before. Actually, you might be listening to it far in the future. Who knows? I thank you for listening. Thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing in my martial arts journey, the journey of Whistlekick, and sharing your experiences with us, with others. The show continues to grow. Whistlekick continues to grow. And it's thanks in no small part to all of you. Our guest today is a Kung Fu practitioner who has an unquestionable passion for martial arts. He started young when he saw a Bruce Lee movie, and that set him on a path that would encompass the next few decades. Shifu Chris Friedman wanted to be a martial artist, and his dedication to the arts didn't stop it just wanting. He went on to continue his journey in China, where he continually lives, training in the mountains of Shaolin. He's truly an interesting guy, so let's welcome him. Shifu Chris, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi, Jeremy. Glad to be here. Hi. I'm glad to have you here. How are you today? I'm doing okay. Uh, had a rough day. I woke up at 3.30 in the morning, couldn't fall back asleep, and then I had this uh, killer tooth pain, but other than that, everything's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I appreciate you powering through. You know, this is towards the end of your day, beginning of my day, so this has been a long day for you. Yeah, pretty much. All right. Well, well, thanks for, for accommodating that. You know, we're, we're excited to have you, and I'm sure the listeners are looking forward to hearing more from you. Yeah, man. Let's go back. It's a, it's a, it's a standard question. It's almost, it almost seems like a boring question, but it's the way we've got to start. Mm -hmm. How did you find the martial arts? Uh, I got started when I was nine years old. I saw a Bruce Lee movie, and uh, after, right after I saw the Bruce Lee movie, I became a fanatic for Asian martial arts and Asian culture. And uh, I wanted to learn martial arts after that, but uh, my father made a deal with me. He said. Um, you got to get a certain grade in school and then I'll send you to a school. So it took me two years to get that grade. And uh, there was only one martial arts school in my hometown, which was a karate school. And they taught Tang Sudo Karate. So uh, two years later, I finally got the grade. My dad said he'll send me to the school. And uh, that was a uh, Tang Sudo Karate Center. And uh, I was just crazy about it after that. Uh, my, my family, my father and my mother came from uh, dancing backgrounds. Uh, so, you know, I kind of have like it in my blood to be like a movement type of person. And um, that was it. That, that was, That's what got me started in martial arts. What was that Bruce Lee movie? Do you remember? That I couldn't tell you. <laughs> Which one? Okay. Okay. No, it, it, it's funny that whatever that first movie is for so many folks tends to be the, the, especially when we're talking Bruce Lee films, the one that people go back to time and again. For me, you know, Enter the Dragon was my first Bruce Lee film and it's my favorite and maybe because it's under the dragon, but taught from talking to folks on the show, most likely because it was the first one I saw. It's the one that sticks in my head the most. Yeah. Totally. What was it about 
watching Bruce Lee or watching that movie that made you so interested? Mm, good question, because I don't have a really clear memory at the time. I mean, I was nine years old. I'm 46 now. Uh, I know I was a really active kid. I mean, I was I was pretty athletic. I wasn't into sports. I never liked sports. I never liked group sports. But I could, you know, run and climb like a monkey. I was really athletic and full of energy. Um, I kind of liked fighting. I didn't get into street fights, but you know, I was a uh, you know uh, agile. I had an older brother. I, I still have an older brother. He was a big, strong guy. You know, he used to beat the hell out of me. You know, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Um, I don't know what it was, but I, 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 I would have to guess that it was the fact that my father and mother, you know, when they were in their early 20s, they were professional dancers. So I think, you know, it's just genetics that I'm, you know, inclined to do this type of activity. But I don't know. I don't remember, like, even seeing or hearing the word martial art before I was nine years old. I, what my vague me- memory was, I saw the Bruce Lee movie. And this was my first introduction to martial arts, and I was like, "Whoa, what is this? I gotta learn this stuff." And and yeah. that that start started the journey. <laughs> mm. And that's the story for so many others. They get this exposure to martial arts and just think, "Man, I have to do that." But I'm curious, was dance ever part of your life? Uh, yes, but that was after I started martial arts. Um, I started martial arts when I was 11, and the only time I ever took a break from then till now was. Um, when I was 13 years old and the whole hip hop scene hit the, came to Long Island in New York and uh, I was really into break dancing. So during my, my about my two year uh, break dancing career, I took off from martial arts and uh, and then I after that faded out, I got back into martial arts again. One of the things I find fascinating about break dancing is that so many folks involved in break dancing don't realize how martial some of those movements are. Yeah, I wrote, anybody that's watched capoeira, I mean, it's mm-hmm. it, it, you're you're watching breakdancing with two people. Totally, uh, I, I wrote an article about that. Um, it's on jetly.com, uh, hip hop. Oh, cool. Hip hop kung fu connection, and you know, you you if you watch a documentary about the uh, the origins of breakdancing, you'll see them say the same thing. You know, part of their influence was from the old kung fu movies. You know, yeah, so much fun, and you know, probably why I enjoy watching either. You know, someone who's very skilled in the martial arts or someone who's very skilled in breakdancing. Other fi- styles of dance don't really resonate with me in the same way, but I'll watch breakdancing all day. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good stuff, man. Cool. Obviously, you started martial arts. Obviously, you were hooked. You stepped out. You came back. And you're still going. So there's something that you found in martial arts training that maybe was missing or at the very least really struck you. What was that? To me, I, I, I always feel like this. I mean, I do martial arts every single day of my life, pretty much. Um, I don't look at it as a career, although I, I do plan to run a school one day professionally. I don't look at it as a hobby, really, uh, as a way of life, maybe. It, to me, it's like, it's like an animal, you know? Like, I feel like I'm an animal, and this is my natural instinct to do this. I mean, like, you know... It just feels just like a natural thing for me to do. And if I don't do it, I feel I get angry. I feel uncomfortable. I feel hostile. So it's just it's just a natural thing to do. You know, I mean, uh, for example, on my Facebook page there's a lot of friends who are into martial arts and they see where I'm coming from. I, I live in Songshan Shaolin. Um, I've been in China 10 years. I've done a whole bunch of interesting stuff. And, you know, sometimes I, I, I feel like some people get envious or jealous, you know. And uh, I don't think it's, it's I'm not trying to show off how cool I am or, hey, look at me. I'm a I'm a, I'm a kung fu guy. I'm a martial art guy. It's just just something natural, you know, just something that comes natural to me. You know, not that's not something I got to put a whole lot of thought into. It's just I do it. I've been doing it my whole life and I love it, of course, you know, but it's not something I consciously decide I'm going to do this. It's just a part of who I am. You know what I mean? I do. I do. Because I feel the same way. I understand. And I think at least a large portion of the folks listening, certainly a good number of the guests that we've had on the show have felt the same way. It's hard to separate who you are as a a person from martial arts. And in fact, longtime listeners will know early on, we had a question that we asked, what would your life look like without martial arts? And we abandoned that question because the answer was the same every time. It was, uh, I don't know. I can't even conceptualize of that. I think if I had to answer that question, 
Uh, I would just say I'm, I'm sure I would be obsessed with some other art form. If I wasn't a martial artist, mm. I would be obsessing about something else, maybe dance or, or something else. <laughs> Sports, maybe. Do you do any, I mean, when we, when we think of art, you know, in the conventional sense, painting, drawing, et cetera, does any of that strike a chord for you? Uh, when I was younger, I was into writing, writing music. Uh, I did, I did music for a long time, but I don't do that anymore. Now I, I write a lot. Um, I write articles. I'm working on a novel. I wrote a screenplay. So, um, that's my, uh, artistic outlet these days. It seems like those of us that are in the martial arts, if we weren't doing martial arts, as you said, there'd be some other sort of creative artistic pursuit in there. I think people underestimate how creative martial arts truly is at the heart what do you think um yeah i mean uh i worked in america i worked as a personal trainer for about a decade i didn't really love the job but it was it was better than the other options i had um and i when i when i exercise here um let's say for example yesterday i was working with the uh guandao you know it's like a big staff with a big uh big blade at the end and Mm -hmm. uh i have a, a light version and a heavy version um, the heavy version, I'm not sure how, how heavy it is, but I'm going to guess it's about 45 pounds, but it, it's, it really feels like a lot when you're swinging it around and jumping in the air and doing all these things. It's just an intense, amazing workout. I haven't finished the form yet, actually. And, um, you know, I'm thinking like, uh, okay, this is, this is, you know, at the root of what this, what this is doing for you, this is conditioning training, you know, it's like strength training. You're also working your balance and your coordination. And, you know, I could be doing this amazing form with this amazing weapon and this beautiful art form, or I could be in a gym holding a dumbbell, you know, lifting my arm up and down. Here on Martial Arts Radio, we we tell our story through other people's stories. Mm-hmm. You've moved from the U.S. to China. You've changed arts. You're writing books. I'm sure there are stories behind all of those aspects and a ton more. I'd love for you to tell us your favorite martial arts story. Whether, however, that question works for you. Okay, uh, I have several good stories, but if I have to choose one that I think will be the most interesting for the listeners, it's a uh, it's a time, not the only time, but a time when I use my skill in a confrontation. And uh, this would be the last time I used it, which was a year and a half ago here in Songshan Shaolin. And uh, this story might make me some enemies or maybe some people like this story but it happened to me and i'm going to tell it as it as it is okay so what happened was <clears throat> where we lived before my wife and i uh it was kind of a hotel um but more like a like a homey hotel type of thing so this is like a, a rural vi- village here and uh there's sometimes you just have dogs running around so my wife at the time was uh, teaching uh, Chinese, she's Chinese, Chinese and English to uh, our, our teacher's students, full-time Kung Fu students. And uh, she would come home around um, three o'clock in the afternoon. So it's down a dirt path and uh, to get to where we lived. And there's these three big stray dogs that just hang around this area. So I would give my wife a staff to walk around with. And I told her if the dogs ever come near you, just point it to their face because that worked for me before. And most of these dogs don't attack you, but they'll harass you. And she's a tiny little thing, and she's scared to death of these dogs. So uh, I was home in the yard. They have an outside yard, just like one of those kung fu movie type yards. And I'm practicing. And I didn't realize the time, but I hear, roof, roof, roof. I hear the barking of the dogs. So uh, it didn't register in my brain right away. And then about 20 seconds later or 30 seconds later, I realized they're still barking. It's 3 o'clock. My wife's coming home. The dogs are harassing my wife so i grab a bottle there was an empty uh beer bottle like a big 40 ounce type of bottle wasn't mine uh in the yard and uh i run out the back door of this place i was living and i see her short 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 enough on the corner the three dogs are around her growling and she's frozen stiff with fear so i'm running towards the dogs and i toss the bottle in the direction it lands on the ground shatters the dogs run off I run up to my wife, I grab the staff, and I start chasing the dogs as fast as I can with the staff. One of the dogs turns right, I turn right, and boom, this farmer steps in my face. Now, I'm, I'm 46. I'm going to guess he was like maybe hmm, 40, 41, 42. 
He's a little shorter than me, but stocky, strong build. And he's in my face, chest up in my face, blocking my way, like a foot away from me. So I'm telling him in Chinese, you know, I'm yelling at him, the dogs are trying to bark, bite my wife. And he's saying something. I, they have a strong dialect here. I can't, I can't understand what he's saying. But I think what he's saying is uh, the dogs won't bite your wife. They'll just, you know, harass her, but they're not going to bite her. So I'm waving my hands around. I have a staff in my hand and uh, yelling at him, get the hell out of my face. You know, I'm, I'm protecting my wife. You know, these three dogs are surrounding my wife, growling at her. What am I supposed to do? You're going to step in my face at this moment? <laughs> So the guy tries to snatch the staff out of my hand, you know, and he had like a little bit of an attitude, like, you know, um, he's going to, you know, show me who's boss or something. So, you know, my adrenaline was pumping, you know, I, I'm a nice guy. I'm a humble guy, but I also could have a temper under the right circumstances. So he grabs the staff, trying to grab the staff out of my hand and I'm, I'm not giving it to him. So we're playing a tug of war here and we were both like kind of in almost like a horse stance pulling at each other. So I tried to pull the staff out of his hand, you know, with the, the, the technique you see, you know, they, they whip it out of the hand. But this guy's a farmer. In, in this area, they farm with tools. They do this all day outside, winter and summer. They have hand tools in their hands, so their grip is strong as hell. And he probably grew up around here. He might have some comfort training. So he's not letting go. So I'm furious at this point. So this thing, I'm not giving in to this guy. I'm not letting go of the staff. And, you know, whatever, whatever. I'm going to get this guy off me and off my staff. Now, at the time, I had little injuries all over the place. I had my back hurt, my knee hurt, my neck hurt. So I'm just thinking, what's the easiest way to get this guy off me? So at the distance we were at, I just start flicking my fingers towards his eyes. I wasn't trying to take out his eye. I wasn't trying to blind him. But I was going to just pop him enough to make him let go. So I'm flicking my fingers at his eyes. And for some reason, they're not connecting. Or this guy is just really tough and he's not showing pain or something. So then he's holding on. At one point, he lets go, and we're yelling at each other again. And then he goes again and tries to grab the staff and pull it away from me. So again, we're playing tug of war. And again, I'm flicking my fingers at his face. And I, at one point, I try to kick him in the groin, and that also missed its target. So finally, I'm determined. I'm going to get this guy off me and out of here. He's messing with me at the wrong time. I'm protecting my wife. He doesn't need to be stepping in my face and getting physical with me when I'm protecting my wife from three straight dogs. So boom, I bounce my finger off his eyeball he he doesn't yell or scream or anything he lets go of the stick turns around and walks towards his house now my heart is beating you know a mile a minute here i turn around i start heading back to where i live my adrenaline's pumping i look at my hand and my middle finger is pointing in the wrong direction it's 45 degrees in the wrong direction so i must have hit his forehead in somewhere along the line and disconnected my finger so I grab my finger, and like I've seen in the movies before, I, I pull on it, I pop it back into place. Now I, I rush back to, the, to, to where I live, I close the gate, I'm in the yard, I'm scared, are these people gonna come after me? I don't know what's gonna happen. So I go up to my roof, and I, I do some exercise, and I sit down and meditate on a roof. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a really a beautiful scenery over there, and uh, I'm just sitting there meditating, I'm trying to calm down, I'm trying to get my adrenaline to slow down, my heartbeat to slow down, and my wife, she knew what happened. I told her the story before I went to the roof and meditated. She sneaks up there with the camera for some reason and snaps a picture of me meditating on the roof. So I like the picture, so I put the picture on my Facebook page. And it's it's interesting, the response I got. I got responses like, wow, it's amazing to see you living such a peaceful life in such a crazy world and uh, all this stuff about how peaceful my life is. And they had no idea. I just had this crazy fight with three dogs and throwing bottles at them and staffs and groin kicks and eye pokes and dislocated fingers. And they're just saying how, how peaceful my life is and how everything is amazing in my life. But so that picture is on my Facebook page and it, 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 it has the date of when this event happened. So I think that was an interesting story. There, there's a lot of substance in there, of course. And, you know, I, I you alluded to it beforehand that there may be some folks who aren't thrilled with this story, but I love it because it's very real. I think oftentimes in martial arts, we, we try to pretend that we're not human, that we don't have emotion, that we don't get upset, that we don't feel protective of the people that we love. And of course we spend all of our training time or the majority of our training time talking about what we would do as it relates to confrontations with human beings. But here you're presented with a situation with dogs. I don't know how to handle that situation. <laughs> <laughs> I had a not anywhere close to as serious, but I had a, a 
similar run in with the dog and I didn't have a stick in my hand, but I reacted in nearly the same way. So I can certainly understand what that emotional response is. And I didn't even have someone that I was protecting. Yeah, I, I, I got some slack about this on uh, on a message board that, that I uh, discussed this topic with. And, uh, you know, I could understand people think, OK, it wasn't such a serious situation where you had to attack the guy's groin and eyes. But the thing is, OK, the reason I I chose to do those techniques and first of all, I, I wasn't trying to injure the guy. I was trying to get him off me in the easiest way possible. I had lots of injuries all over my body. I had reconstructed knee surgery in China. I didn't have I didn't have therapy after that. And I'm still training daily at 46. And the guy got physical with me. I didn't get physical with him. You know, I if, if I saw a guy running after wild dogs, I wouldn't step in his face. You know, that's the first that's the first thing. Common sense. I wouldn't I wouldn't step in this guy's face and say, yo, don't do that. If a guy's, you know, frantic and chasing these dogs, he has some reason for doing that. I wouldn't, I just wouldn't approach him that way at that time. Second of all, I told him the dogs want to bite my wife. Okay, so if I see a guy running crazy, he's protecting his his wife from three dogs, I'm not stepping in that guy's face. You know, I mean, I don't think that's a, right. a, a common sense thing to do. Then he's going to go and get physical with me. He's going to grab my stick and pull it out of my hand. I mean, if I was doing this because I was being a punk, you know, I could see him stepping in my face, grabbing a staff out of my hand. Now I'm protecting my wife from three straight dogs. So he's standing up for three straight dogs. I'm protecting my wife from three straight dogs. So, you know, it's a matter of principle here. I mean, I'm not, I'm not handing over the stick and saying, yes, sir, here you go. I won't protect my wife from three straight dogs. Those dogs should, they might've been his dogs. I'm not sure, but those dogs should not be on the road harassing people when they go home. You know what I mean? And I don't think he should be stepping in my face when I'm protecting my wife. I mean, so Again, I just I was it was it was a matter of principle here. I, I'm not I'm not handing over this stick to you. You know, you you stepped to me. You got physical with me. I'm protecting my family. So no, I'm not I'm not going to give in to that. You know, and and the techniques I use, I just wanted to get this guy off me, simple as possible. I saw the guy a couple weeks later. He was okay. He didn't have any injuries. I wasn't trying to injure him. I wasn't trying to hurt him enough to to do any serious damage. I was just trying to get the guy off, and it worked. You know, I mean, I injured myself in the process, but. I don't I don't think I did the wrong thing, you know, even so some people might. But, you know, in my opinion, what I did was justifiable. Well, I I love that to me, new self-defense technique, the idea of trying to flick someone in the eye or near the eye or, you know, in the forehead and cause them to kind of pull back. I, th I think that's a great one. I mean, I, I did, you I did hurt your finger did, doing actually, it. But I did actually <laughs> land the last strike in his eye. I felt my finger okay. bounce off his eyeball. So it did connect, and that's what made him turn around and let go. Another thing is these guys are so tough here. This lifestyle in Songshan Shaolin is, is very primitive. They go the whole winter with no heat, day and nighttime, and it can get down to 20 degrees. People live with no heat. Some of them still, most of them still have outhouses outside. They farm with hand tools. So they're tough. You know, these people are tough, you know. I mean, if someone poked me in the eye, I would be on the floor screaming, I think. I wouldn't just turn around and walk away. <laughs> But yeah, as far as why have you, as far as a strategy a strategy of fighting goes, if you want to analyze this whole situation based on what you know the, the fighting situation, it was definitely a kung fu fighting strategy. First of all, we didn't go to the ground, so I didn't let it go to the ground. That's number one in kung fu to have good stances and not topple to the floor. Two, I, I went for vital areas, groin and eyes, and and there was even a staff involved, so that was totally a kung fu fighting situation here. Yeah. You mentioned the environment that you're in, you know, how rural it is, how simple the life so many of these folks are living. Why have you chosen to live there? Uh, purely for the martial art experience. I mean, I, I lived in China 10 years at first. I lived in Beijing, and that was also for martial arts. I lived there about three years. Yeah, probably about three years. I studied Bagua Zhang, um, Chinese wrestling, Shui Jiao. Those two systems, uh, Bagua Zhang and Shui Jiao. I did those styles there. And then uh, I didn't like the life in Beijing. The, the weather is, is nasty. The, it's, the environment is just strict. And I, don't, I, didn't like, I didn't, just didn't like the place. So I, eventually I moved to Shenzhen, which is in Hong Kong in southern China. It's beautiful, beautiful modern city. Just a, just a beautiful place. And uh, I could I could teach English and make money. I, I did acting jobs about once a week. No, not once a week. Once a month. And uh, 
the life was really easy. I had a nice little studio, but th- there was barely any martial art training there because it's a very modern city. The people there just they could care less about martial arts. So I had one teacher who was two hours away from my where I lived, and I would see him about once a week. I had to travel two hours on the bus there and back, so a total four hours of training. And it was a private lesson, so I had no partners to train with. And uh, so, you know, my reason for coming to China wasn't just to live in a beautiful city and have an easy life. It was to do martial arts, you know. So I started taking trips down to Shaolin. Uh, I took two trips. And the second trip, I met my current teacher. And uh, he suggested you should come down here. He said, you know, if you're really into martial arts, this is the place to be. And and, uh, I love the environment here because, I mean, I've lived in a lot of cities. I lived in New York City. I lived in Brooklyn, Queens. I lived in cities in China. And, you know, there was a point in my life where I really wanted that. But at this point in my life, I I want the opposite. I want to be totally alone if possible. So here, where I live right now, which is in the village outside of Shaolin, called Songshan Shaolin. And it's, uh, I can, you know, walk down the street and just see beautiful views of mountains, you know. If, if I had the time, I could go train, you know, find just find a spot and train. I can go train with my Shifu. I, there's another school I train at where I do Chinese kickboxing with, with some young young fighters. They, once a week, I go there, they train me. And uh, so it's just the environment for, for martial art training is, is amazing. And uh, the next step in my life is to, to open a school outside of China, maybe a couple of years later. So um, so this whole experience here is just it's just the ultimate martial art experience. Like uh, if I, you know, have to live, eat simple food and don't have heat half the time and uh, there's nothing to do but train. I mean, the whole thing, if you're a, a Shaolin Kung Fu practitioner or teacher, this is part of the experience. You know, this is part of the, the mental discipline and the training, you know, toughening your body. And, and this is part of the training, you know. Hmm. How is your perception, opinion of Kung Fu as your training it now how has your view changed since you've been there in china or i imagine with this well i I imagine that with this level of immersion you know in the homeland so to speak and just being in it and practicing so much in this location i've got to imagine that that's had an impact on not your just the physical training and, and what you've gotten out of it but I think there are probably a number of folks listening thinking, I would love to do that. They have an idea of what it would be like. And you certainly had an idea of what it would be like before you did it. But I found that ideas and reality are generally at least a little different. So I'm curious if anything is noticeably different from what you had expected. Hmm, okay, that's a good question. Uh, if I if I think about that, it'll take me back to when I was starting out in karate, and I used to watch the old kung fu movies on uh, Channel Five, and I'm in in Long Island, New York. They want Channel Five at Saturday, three o'clock, and uh, after that, I would dress up in my gi, go in my backyard, and and do my katas and stuff, and pretend I was in the kung fu movies. So I mean, um, it's oh I okay all right let me let, let me let me get this clear. So okay. Um, you know, have you ever seen the old Kung Fu TV show called Kung Fu with David Carradine? Yeah. yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Like in those episodes, they always had some, um, like he always did something that made it seem like he had some magic powers or, or amazing mental control, right? So yeah. like, okay, I remember one episode where uh, he was wrongly accused of stealing something and they threw him in this outside prison and he was in there with another prisoner and it was freezing cold. And that was part of the torture, you know, all night in a freezing cold outside cell. Right. So the other guy mm-hmm. looks at him and goes, how come you don't feel the cold, Chinaman? And then he teaches the guy how to meditate. And then in the morning, when the, when the guards come to open the door and expect to see them half dead, they're just sitting there peacefully meditating. So like it, it gives them this like almost like magical um, power or something. But in reality, It is like that, but that's not the reason why it's like that. Because, like I said here, the people live with no heat, including all the Kung Fu students. There's a bunch of full-time Kung Fu students here uh, in various schools and inside the Shaolin Temple. And the whole year round, they have no heat. They, They eat three basic meals a day, really basic meals a day, drink only water. They don't have Coke or juice or anything, just water, three simple meals a day. They sleep in cots. They have 
no heat. They take a shower maybe once a week. They train all day long. They take a shower once a week. Um, so they just get unbelievably tough, you know, and used to this. They don't have a choice. You know, they're just, this is a poor neighborhood and they're just used to this lifestyle. So um, me and my wife were, were going back to America at the beginning of this year. She had never been there before. And from, from here to Florida, where my dad lives, we had to first go to Beijing and then we had to get it. We had to get in a hotel, get up in the morning, take another plane. The whole thing took two days of travel. The flight itself was like 17 hours. And we got off the plane like feeling fresh, like, OK. And like the reason why we could put up with all that insanity and still feel good is just we have such a tough lifestyle here that when when you leave, everything feels easy. So um, part of the training here is, is that, you know, it's just just uh, living in this environment and this lifestyle makes you tough. So that's part of it. But as far as like in the old Kung Fu movies, they had all these like um, different chambers and amazing uh, training methods. It's, it's a little bit different than that. Um, basically, the training in Shaolin and Songshan Shaolin and all the schools here is like this. They have uh, basics, which are punching and kicking drills done in a line drill. They have acrobatics, which the younger kids do. They do flips and stuff. They have uh, the forms, the empty hand forms, the weapon forms. They have... Uh, Fighting, which is sanda, Chinese kickboxing with throws. They have traditional applications and they have specialty skills, which is like sometimes you could say it's like a strongman feats where like uh, this guy's specialty is iron hand and he breaks bricks. And this my teachers, one of my teachers specialties is heavy weapons. He does the sure saw, which is similar to like a kettle drum, but it has a whole routine. It's square in shape and uh, they throw it around, lands on his fist, lands on his elbow. He's twirling around, does this really amazing routine. And then another one is uh, this big, like, 100-pound weapon that he swings around. So they have these specialty skills. And then, you know, you'll see a lot of stuff in performances that they do strictly for performance. So the training is, is a little different. Um, the training is, is great, in my opinion. But it's not like you couldn't get this training in New York. You know, there's tons of great Kung Fu masters in New York who could teach you pretty much the same thing. But the environment here is what makes it so special, in my opinion. I mean, you're in the mountains here. You see people training full time. There's nothing else to do. You live in this simple, tough lifestyle. So I, I think that's the main difference, you know? Mm. There, there's a romantic element to it, certainly. There's the lifestyle. Out the, the lifestyle yeah. is different. Like if I, if I was in New York right now and I was taking Kung Fu classes, you know, I could, I could learn the same forms if I went to a Shaolin Kung Fu school. I could learn the basics. I could learn the specialty skills. But I wouldn't have this environment where I live now. Like they train here outside all year round. They train all day long, full time students. That's an unusual thing, you know, to be around people doing Kung Fu all day long. That's their like full time endeavor. They train all day long. So that's like a really, you know, inspirational um, environment to be in. And uh, so I think the difference is, is that it's, it's, it's the environment and the lifestyle here. The training is not all that different than it would be back in the States if you had a good teacher. One of my favorite questions to ask all of our guests is about the harder challenges of life. Martial artists, we, we have this broader skill set. We have physical skills. We have emotional skills, mental skills that seem to be able to overcome pretty much anything. I'd love for you to tell us about a time when things weren't going well and how you were able to use your martial arts training to get through it. Okay. Um, I, I would have to say that was, that's been my whole life, my whole life story. Um, starting from my childhood because my upbringing was, was not the, the, the smoothest upbringing. Um, my parents were divorced when I was five years old, didn't see my mother after six. Um, my dad was busy working all the time. We didn't really spend a whole lot of family time. My brother, uh, dropped out of high school, spent a year in jail um, there was a lot of drugs going around. I was a musician at the time. So, um, you know, I didn't have a whole lot of guidance, basically. So if I didn't have martial arts in my life, um, I would guess there's a good possibility I would be dead. I could have went to prison. I could have became a criminal. So just doing martial arts gave me some positive outlet. And um, it helped me through all my times, you know, I mean, uh, I've, I've had depression back in the States. I had pretty bad depression. 
Um, and, you know, just doing exercise, doing martial arts would help me out with that. But I'm still struggling to this day. I mean, I'm, I'm 46 years old and I've sacrificed basically what most people live for to, to live this lifestyle. I mean, I don't have a car. I don't have a great career. I don't have a house. I don't have a whole lot of money in the bank. So I'm struggling daily. I'm still struggling daily. But for me, it's not really so much an option. You know, um, I think it's just uh, like karma or fate, you know, to, to be to be put into a certain body and to, to have a certain lifestyle it just comes natural. So, I mean, but if I didn't have martial arts in my life, I would definitely if I wasn't obsessed with some other art that was helping me out, you know, emotionally, um, I would have definitely ran into some really serious situations in my life. I've often heard older, much smarter folks and I say that, you know, we tend to find what we need in life, whether that's a person or a practice like martial arts. And it sounds like you found what you needed and now you've ended up where you need to be. Guess you could say that. Yeah. As you look back through all the folks that you've trained with under, if you had to pick one of them out, to say this was the most influential person for me as it relates to my martial arts. And, and I suppose the answer doesn't even have to be a martial artist. Who was it that's made the strongest impact on your training and, and just kind of your view of martial arts? Mm, I can't really pinpoint a particular person, but if I had to look at it from the self-defense fighting aspect, I would say my older brother. Um, he is, uh, he's about three and a half years older than me. He's about the same height as me, which is five feet nine. But he's about, he varies from like 185 to like 205. I weigh about 165 pounds. So he, he's, he's a lot bigger than me. And he's very strong, very aggressive, very crazy. And he used to wrestle in high school. So uh, when we grew up, which was a pretty wild household, um, you know, Sometimes he'd beat me up. It wasn't anything serious, but, you know, he'd, he'd beat me up like older brothers beat up their younger brothers. And then later on, we'd have our sparring matches. When I started doing karate, we used to have our sparring matches. And every single time we had a sparring match, it ended the same way. Because I was doing Tung Sudo at the time, which is mostly kicking. So I would kick him a few times. He'd close the gap, grab me, tie me up on the ground helplessly. So um, this was before the first UFC, before 1993 even. So uh, I started coming to this conclusion, like, okay, now what if this was a street fight? Um, what if some guy grabbed me and tied me up? He's not going to just let me go, you know? So I, I started realizing, okay, I, there's something missing from my training. I got to learn how to grapple because kicking doesn't always work, you know? So that led me to my second martial arts, which was uh, Bujikan Budo Taijutsu, also known ninjutsu. So uh, I was already, it was the 80s anyway, so I was... No, actually, by the 90s, I think, but by the time I got into ninjutsu. And uh, I was already interested in that stuff, reading books from Stephen Hayes and Ashita Kim. And um, I listened to both of their, their, their casts. It was really cool. So, uh, mm. so um, yeah, so I, I, I found a teacher in Long Island where I was living at the time. And the first one of the first questions I asked him was, is there any grappling in the system? And he said, yeah, it's about 60% grappling. So I, I wound up training in that system, eventually getting a black belt in that system. And... Uh, that changed our sparring matches, my brother and I. Uh, after that, I knew how to, how to handle myself. If he grabbed me, I would, I would do some nasty poke or, or something to him. And uh, so that led me to, to learn how to grapple. And that was before. I didn't learn by watching the UFC that that was necessary. I learned from my older brother, who was bigger, stronger, and wrestling trained, that you needed to know how to grapple. So uh, he influenced me to, to learn how to grapple. But as I've had so many teachers and I've studied from so many systems and my philosophy these days is I, I like I need a teacher. Yes. Or I need several teachers. Yes. But I don't need a master. I don't feel like this anymore. Like I need someone to guide me, to show me the way I feel. I have 35 years experience and I'm, I'm learning all the time. I mean, I'm, I have a lot to learn, but I, I don't feel like someone's got the secrets that I need to know. I just feel like this is what I want to learn. This is what I like. So I'm going to go to this person and learn it. And that, that, that's pretty much my view of things these days. Let's flip that question on its head. If you could train with someone that you haven't, anywhere in the world, anywhere in time, alive or dead, who would you want to train with? Uh, 
if I if right now I'm happy with my training, I'm I'm happy right where I am, the teachers I have. But if I went back in time, you know, maybe like let's say ten or fifteen years ago, I I think I might pick Hoist Gracie. Uh, I liked his style back in the day, um, cause like, like he was a smaller guy and he could defeat bigger guys using technique, and um, and also he wore the gi, you know, so he's like I considered him a traditional martial artist because he wore the gi. And I like I liked his style. I liked his style because he was like uh, he wasn't super aggressive. He used good technique, and he you know he strategized uh, you know against his opponent and, and just you know beat them with technique and, and you know superior uh, strategy. So I like that way of thinking. Um, I wouldn't do that now because I have re- reconstructive knee surgery and I don't I don't like uh, rolling on the ground anymore. I feel scary to me. I don't want to twist my knee. Um, so uh, I, I still do some throws and stand-up sparring, but I don't like uh, too much to do in, on the groundwork. But um, if I had to pick another person to train with, mm, I have fans I have, but I don't know if I'd want to train with them. I'm pretty satisfied with my training right now. Fair enough. Let's talk about competition. It tends to be a, a bit of a polarizing subject. Is competition something that you've engaged in? I have, yep. Uh, not not to a, a really large extent of, but I, I have done some um, when I was doing the Tong Su Do uh, the school I was training at went to uh, towards the end of my training in Tong Su Do they, they went to some I, I, it was some kind of national mm, competition it was a huge Tong Su Do competition they held once a year so I participated in that twice and that was point fighting and kata and uh, I got disqualified both times in, in point fighting for excessive contact um, and, and I think part of the reason for that was I, I've never really been that into competition. I always thought of, of martial arts as self-defense and the way you fight in a competition for me is not the way I would fight in, in, a, in a street fight because I'm always looking to do the opposite of what the person's doing. If, if they want to kick me, I, I'm, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to outsmart them. So, uh, so I always thought like the competition was, it was a good, good, you know, experience and a good training uh tool but i I didn't think it was like the ultimate goal for me because like there's people stronger than me there's people bigger than me there's people better conditioned than me but i believe that if if they back me up in the corner i'll do what i got to do to get out of it you know i I, even if you know no matter who it was i I think if, if 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 i'm forced like to defend myself seriously even if they could kick my ass in a ring or they could kick my ass in a tournament or tap me out or whatever. I, I still think I would get out of that somehow. I would figure out a way. But anyway, so I did those two tongues to those tournaments. I got disqualified. I was cross training at the time also. This is an interesting story if you want to hear it. Um, I was going. Please. Um, it was actually a little bit before the competition, but I was I was training at this little nice little dojo in a nice neighborhood, um, and I had gotten my yellow belt. And uh, about. 20 minutes away was a little rougher neighborhood and they had a community center and they had, they had karate classes in the community center. So I wanted to check out the, the community center karate classes too and do some cross training. So I went there and it was like almost free. It was like $20 a month. And the teacher was a stocky Spanish guy with a, a bald head and like a Fu Manchu mustache. And his name was Sensei Jose. So I started taking classes there at both schools, and I, I made the mistake of wearing my yellow belt. I was really proud of this. And nobody in this school had a yellow belt. They all had white belts. So um, the second class I went to at this school, the teacher, Sensei Jose, had his friend come down from the Bronx, who had a school in the Bronx, and uh, these tough-ass street kids, you know, coming down from the Bronx to train with us. I was like maybe 12 years old, I think, from you know a nice little suburban neighborhood. So we train with them and we're doing like arm banging and wrist escapes and stuff. And at the end of the class, we all line up in a kneeling position uh, facing each other, their school versus us. So we're in kneeling position there in front of us. Right. And our, my teacher was in the middle and uh, he would call somebody up. Boom. They jump to their knees, go to the other side, call somebody up, jump to the knees, come to the middle, get in their fighting stance. And boom. Just go at it. No, no gloves, nothing. And uh, so, OK, so it's my turn. He calls me up. And uh, I had this like kind of small Mexican guy who was my opponent. And I remember, you know, I was kind of getting the best of him because I was a little bigger than him. But he was really tough and he was coming at me going for his. So then, OK, our match finished. And then there was a couple more matches. And then I remember there was a match from one kid from our school and one kid from their school. And they were about, I'm guessing, this was a long time ago, 16 years old, maybe. 
So two, two black kids, right? So they're, they're sparring, and the kid from our school kicks the one kid in the ribs, and the kid's going down. And he's, this kid was so fast, he does a spinning hook kick while he's falling down and catches the guy from our school. So he gets kicked, he's falling down, boom, he whips out a spinning hook kick while he's falling to the ground and catches the other guy. And everybody was, you know, amazed and stuff. So then, okay, there's another match or two. Then he said, okay, so our teacher's looking down their row. He picks that kid again, 16 years old, okay? And then he looks up and down our row, going to choose somebody from our school, and my heart is beating. I'm like, there's no way he's going to pick me to fight this kid. I was 11 years old. This kid was 16. He was like twice my size. He goes, okay, Chris, let's see what you got. Boom. I jump up to my knees, and, you know, I'm scared to death because, you know, you're 11 years old. You're fighting a 16-year-old. It's like a huge difference, man. So the, anyway, the kid winds up kicking me in my nose, and, like, my eyes are watering, and they're, they're like, filled with water. And I'm, I'm worried about if I blink, I'm going to, I'm gonna like, some tears are going to fall down my face. So, okay, so after that, there was these two, two other white kids who came to the school. It was me and two other white kids. Everybody else was Spanish and black in this kind of, like, tough ghetto-type neighborhood. So the one kid was, like, kind of big kid, the one white kid. And he was like teasing me like, ah, oh, yellow belt, yellow belt. And then he found out who my older brother was. They were both in high school together. He was scared to death of my older brother. After that, he was the nicest guy in the world to me. He's like, oh, you know, well, it's a different style. So, you know, it's not the same. But that was a that was an interesting experience. So I did the two Tung Sudo tournaments. Then um, maybe a couple of years later, I was working full time at a school in my hometown. And they taught an eclectic system called Universal Martial System. So I was a full-time instructor there for three years. And um, as part of getting a black belt in that system, you have to compete at least once. So I did another point fighting tournament. I lost that one fair and square. And then about, I would say it was like eight or nine years after that, I, I had the desire to, to do some competition. I felt like I didn't do enough. So I, uh, I was cross-training and grappling. So I did a judo competition, one. I did a jiu-jitsu competition, one. I mean, I didn't win the competition. I did one judo competition and I did one jiu-jitsu competition i didn't win anything but i did one of each and then i got into uh push hands which is a chinese kung fu thing where you're basically uh trying to off balance the person from a stance and you're trying to control their limbs and uh and control your balance and disrupt their balance so that was the first time that i actually took it serious and trained to win and the first competition i fell and tore my knee tore my ligaments and i was in therapy at that time for about four months uh after that i started training again i found my new teacher my new teacher is the first person who ever took me to china so if i didn't tear my knee i wouldn't have met my new teacher who took me to china i wouldn't be living in china for 10 years so after that one year later i competed again in push hands i won first place and then uh i competed another two times uh winning one silver medal in that so my entire competition career consists of four push hands tournaments three point fighting karate tournaments, one judo tournament and one jiu-jitsu tournament. And, and that, that's the extent of it. But uh, it's never been my goal to, to be a, like a competition champion. Um, I like the experiences a lot, but it's not my goal in training really. But I, I do think it was a positive experience. If I look back before I tore my knee and if I was a little younger, I, I should have done at least one kickboxing match maybe, full contact kickboxing match. That would have been nice. But anyway... It's a good experience. All right. Certainly some diversity with the styles that you competed in. Most folks compete in, you know, one, maybe two types of competitions, but I heard you rattle off four there and that's that's pretty impressive. It it shows an ability to adapt and look at things differently and I like that. Yeah, I didn't mind losing either. I didn't I mean when I went into the judo tournament, I was training once a week. I, I just said, you know, what's the worst thing that happened? The guy throws me or p- pins me. I got pinned. I had two matches that day. One guy had wrestled for 12 years. He pinned me. And I look at the match I had on videotape. I could have got out of it, but I kind of hesitated. But it was a great experience. And the other guy was a, 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 from the same school as me. And I had tapped him out on the floor in our dojo. But he was pretty good with the throws. And he beat me slightly on points. And the jiu-jitsu tournament, also, I, was, I don't even think, I was cross-training a little bit in jiu-jitsu, but not seriously. And I went in there, and I had one match. I lost on points. It didn't matter if I lost the one. It was, it was just a really good experience i think when a lot of folks think about china and specifically the shaolin area they're probably thinking back to what they've seen in martial arts movies so they're probably thinking that you know everybody's in a fight all the time and you know it's these dramatic flashy 
martial arts movements 24 hours a day. I'm, I know that's not the case, but when you think of martial arts movies, are there any that you enjoy? I mean, you're kind of in this, this interesting area where you're training so much that I'm not sure if martial arts movies hold entertainment value for you. Uh, when I was younger, I loved them, but as an adult, I, I never watched them anymore, actually. Um, it's like work for some reason. When I was young, I just didn't mm. get enough of that stuff. But nowadays, just can't get into it anymore. I watch comedies, horror movies, thrillers, but I just can't get into the martial art movies anymore. I don't know why. <laughs> I understand. How about books? You mentioned that you're a writer and that you're working on some books. So are there... And, and we'll talk about your writings in a moment here. Are there martial arts related books that you enjoy that you might recommend to the listeners? That's another thing that I, I haven't really been into for a long time. First of all, in China, I can't really, I can speak Chinese. It's not great. I can speak Chinese, but I can't read like a book in Chinese. So um, uh, you, you can't find any English books. I, I actually, someone did give me two English books recently, not too long ago. One's on Shaolin Kung Fu which I, I, I told myself I was going to read, and I never did. And another one was on Buddhism, but I'm, I'm not a Buddhist, so I wasn't all that interested in that. But um, when, I was a, when I was younger, man, I had tons of these books and magazines, VHS tapes. But uh, for some reason, I just... If I have a, if I have a martial art book, I will, I will read it, yes. And I, I would like to have access to books. But when I order them on Amazon, they usually get lost in the mail. And uh, I, if I had access to them, I would be into them. But usually these days, when I start reading a book, I feel like been there, done that. There's nothing, nothing to say in that I don't know already. I mean, not not to say I know everything, but you know, like it's only so many things they could talk about. You know, like it's either like right. I feel like it's a theory that I may or may not actually believe is as valuable as they say it is, or it's just something. It seems like I've, I've been there, done that already for the most part for some reason. Sure. Well, ten years and training significantly greater hours across those 10 years than most people are going to train in a lifetime for some of us multiple lifetimes um, and being in the area that you are i can imagine that you're exposed to a lot and you have time to practice and consider a lot so the the books that may have scratched that itch for you as a child that would you know hold some value to to me You've created this environment for yourself living there that the books are, are trying to help us step into for a time, and you're, you're living it. So it makes complete sense to me. I'd like to hear – I'd like to get a hold of some books like maybe, you know, um, hear some, some, some real-life experiences of some, some of these ancient masters like Yamaguchi or something, you know, hear how they trained and went through. I, I would totally be into that if I could get my hands on some books like that. But I don't, I don't like the instructional books. You know, I don't like to read a book saying, put your leg here, hit him in the throat. Right. Uh, those, those just bore me. Man. Sure. No, completely understandable. And I, I think that we've had that discussion on this show a number of times, the idea that there are two sorts of martial arts books, how to do and kind of why to do. And most of our guests seem to resonate stronger with the, the why books, the conceptual books rather than the physical application. But I might make a suggestion of, of getting your hands on a Kindle so you can order Kindle books. I don't know. I'm assuming that would work for you. Yeah. I was, I was looking into that tonight actually. So yeah, that's, I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and do, they got to down, download some software or something, right? Uh, you you can do that. Amazon has a free reader that you can get on pretty much any phone or tablet. Uh, I, I'm a fan of my actual Kindle just because it's easier on my eyes. It's not backlit in the same way a phone or a computer screen is. But yeah, once once you're set up for that, I mean, you should be able to chomp right through them. And I think they even, I don't know if it's available for you, but here in the U.S., there's a, a program where we can pay, I want to say it's like 10 or $20 a month, and it's all the Kindle books you can read. Really? That's not... You know, it's unlimited access, which is kind of neat. Yeah, I'm going to look into that, man. That's a good, that's a good idea. Cool. We've talked today about how passionate you are about martial arts. For a lot of people, that passion fades, but here you are, you know, you've mentioned your age several times, 46, and it sounds like you are at least as passionate about your training as you've ever been. I'm going to guess more so, which 
makes me ask why. And I don't mean that in any kind of skeptical way. But for most folks that are training that hard, there's a reason. There's there's something motivating them. And I'm curious what it is for you. Mm, I, I, I don't, for me, it's not really like, a, it's not a financial thing, although I do want to run a school one day, not to be a champion fighter. Um, I do like, I like to know I could defend myself. I don't know, maybe because I had a rough childhood. I feel like, uh, you know, I always feel like, I also believe in karma and reincarnation because I've been into Hinduism for a long time. So I, I, I think, you know, like as far as reincarnation goes, um, maybe this might sound weird to some listeners, but I, I believe in this stuff firmly. Like I could have been, you know, in a war in my last lifetime, Vietnam vet or something. And, and this is just left over from my last lifetime. But I totally feel like this is a, I always feel like this threat is there's, there's no threat. I know there's no threat. And that's what, another reason what makes me believe in, in this pasto leftover uh, karma from my last lifetime, maybe because there's no threat. I go outside there's villagers, not, there's no crime around here at all. If it is, it's some petty crime, not violent crimes. So there's no threat. There's no reason for me to feel this. I need my knife by my side when I go to sleep and, you know, I've got to be uh, this master killer. There's no reason to feel it really. There's really not that much danger here, but I, I've always felt that way. So there's something inside me that feels I, I have to know how to, you know, life or death fight if I have to. Um, so that's one thing, that feeling, that, that insecurity feeling, like I always have to know how to fight. And there's also the feeling like I, I have a lot of energy that I got to get rid of, you know, and if I don't get rid of this energy, it's going to come out in a negative way. I mean, I, I have a ten, I, I'm super duper, sh I'm pretty shy actually in real life. And uh, I, I'm pretty humble to people I meet. I, I never in my life go out and start a fight. But uh, I have a slight temper if, if someone victimizes me, if someone wants to go out of their way and pick a quiet, shy guy and choose me as a target, I, I, I feel like, you know, it violates me and I feel angry. So if I don't if I don't train in this fighting art, I feel hostile. I have hostility and I have to get rid of this hostility. And this is a positive way to get rid of it. So, I mean, it's just it's just like a nature balance thing for me. It's not not a goal like i don't have to sit there and think about it why am i doing this what's my goal in the future it's just just natural you know it's just just coming natural to me and it's just doing what i have to do it. it's like i just i have no choice man this is just my who i am in this lifetime <laughs> I have to yeah. tell you. like eating sleeping breathing water training totally man just like that that's kind of that's what i'm hearing yeah We've talked today about, you know, we hinted it at your writings, and now's a good time to talk about what you've written, where people can find that, your website, if you have any social media, you know, commercial time, promote yourself, you know, don't be shy. Okay, so uh, <laughs> my, my martial art writing, I write for, for two sources, which is uh, Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine, Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine, they have a website, Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine .com. they have print articles, uh, I think it's every other month. Okay, they have a they have a print article uh, issue come out. Um, the current issue right now is a special Shaolin edition. It's out right now. You can go to Barnes and Noble, find it in the sports section. You can order it. Um, I don't know where else they sell it, but uh, and it's a special Shaolin edition, which comes out once a year. And I have two two articles running in that right now. Um, they're not about kung fu. They're about the life here in Songshan Shaolin. What is it like to come to Shaolin and train? And if anybody here is interested in coming and training, they could contact me on my website, which is uh, shaolinwithchris.com, shaolinwithchris.com. And they can study with my teacher here, uh, stay for, the, as long as the visa will let you stay, you know, you can train here. It's pretty reasonable, the prices, um, and they can have a normal hotel with a normal bathroom, heat, and they can train. And uh, so that's an option. Um, and I also write for jetly.com. Uh, jetly.com is pretty new. Mm, I think less than a year they've been open and, uh, you can go there. There's all kinds of articles there. Um, if you, if you go on to Google and type my name, Chris Friedman, uh, Jetly author, there'll be a link to all my Jetly articles, online articles. But if you go to the website, you'll have to search through it. If you put search, Chris Friedman, it doesn't come up for some reason. If you go to Google, put my name in Chris Friedman, Jetly author, you'll see it about a dozen articles there 
Also, Kung Fu Tai Chi Magazine also has online articles, which I write for. Uh, I have one coming out soon, um, China versus a knife. China is Chinese grappling, how to defend against a knife using that. That'll have a little video with it, a free online article. That'll be out in about a month or two, something like that. So, yeah, so um, those are my martial art writing. I also wrote a book, uh, Kung Fu Grappling Strategies by Chris Friedman. That's available on Amazon, Kung Fu Grappling Strategies by Chris Friedman. A lot of beautiful pictures in there. A lot of true stories in there about times I and my teachers have used this stuff in real life. Um, and right now I'm writing a novel, which is a true crime uh, novel based on a true story. I don't want to give out too much information because I haven't finished it and haven't copy written it yet. I'm scared someone's going to steal this idea because it's a no brainer. Uh, and it's about a, a true life, a true, true story about a serial killer who was never caught. And, uh, and what's interesting about it is that I'm, I'm filling in the gaps of who this guy is in real life and giving him a personality and a day to day life, which in real life, we don't know what that was like. Um, I wrote a, I wrote a, a movie script, a Kung Fu movie script. Um, and I don't know where that's going, but my uh, my wife is translating that into Chinese right now. We have somebody I have a famous uh, MMA fighter friend here and he knows some people in the, in the movie business. Maybe someone will be interested in that. So that's as far as my writing goes. Uh, if anybody wants to uh, contact me, they can they can find my email address or they can look me up on Facebook, Chris Friedman, and my website's uh, Shaolin with Chris. Uh, and that, that's about it. All right. And of course, as always, we're going to link all this stuff in the show notes, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. So if you're driving or on a treadmill, you won't need to jot notes onto your hand or risk bodily harm to jot this stuff down. Whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Well, I, I appreciate you being here today. And I have one more question for you. Okay. What parting advice would you give the folks listening? Um, can you say that again? I didn't hear it clear. Sure. What wisdom, what parting words would you offer to the folks listening today? Mm, Mark, as far as martial art training goes? Yeah. Training, life. Well, as far as martial art training goes, I, I think there's a trend these days going on where they focus only on fighting. And uh, I, I think that's a mistake because there's a lot of valuable things you can get from martial art training. And if, if you're only training to fight without discipline and respect, you know, it's causing more violence to society. And that's not the goal of martial arts. The goal of martial arts is not to become, to make society more violent, right? So, I mean, if you're going to be a sport fighter, fine, but do it with respect, okay? And uh, the goal of martial arts in my opinion, is not to be the toughest guy in the world and to prove to the world that you're the toughest guy in the world. And that seems to be the trend these days. I mean, I see a lot of stuff on YouTube and on uh, different message boards where the people are challenging each other to fights and, uh, you know, oh, your style sucks and it's not this style, this style, this style, so you don't know how to fight. That's not necessarily true, you know. There's, there's people, great fighters from all styles, you know. And uh, my personal experience, I've used traditional martial arts more than a few times in real life successfully my goal is not to be a fighter but you know all these things like for example discipline and tolerance tolerance is a really important one i think especially for america i mean i've been out of america 10 years now and uh i'm on facebook every day and, I, and i'm watching what's going on i see policemen you know I mean, at the drop of a hat, they're, they're beating on someone, you know, they're twisting their wrists, putting them in cuffs, spraying them with mace at the drop of a hat. I mean, they, all you got to do is say two words, you know, ask a question and boom, they're on you like that. That doesn't show tolerance at all. And uh, I mean, I was watching a documentary recently and they showed a 911 call and uh, the lady was frantic because uh, someone in her house was shot to death and she's crying and screaming, oh, my God. And the lady on the other end of the line is saying, uh, excuse me, calm down or I'm going to hang up. <laughs> I mean, this is a, this is a, an emergency phone call and they're not tolerant enough to understand this person is frantic and they're threatening them to hang up the phone. So tolerance is something the society really, really needs right now. So if someone, you know, says something wrong to you and you train in some style and you're choking him out or beating his face in, 
you know, within seconds. I mean, that, that's not showing tolerance. That's not showing discipline. That's not showing respect. That's just being a tough thug who knows how to fight. And I don't think that's what we need in society right now. So if you're going to go into martial arts, do whatever style suits you, yes. But don't neglect the important aspects of discipline, respect, tolerance. And that's, that's the key right there, in my opinion. Do you feel Chris Friedman is awesome? He's a multi-talented individual with a lot of skills and a dedication to his training that goes far beyond most. Shifu Friedman's journey is something that's special because when you really think about it, he chose his training over a lot of other things. He's made it his life. Shifu Friedman, thank you for sharing your story. If you want to check out the show notes with some photos, links, other things that we talked about during the episode, head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can get links to whistlekick.com. You can see the other episodes. You can get a hold of us on social media. We are at Whistlekick. Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram are our favorite ways to communicate with our friends and our fans. And of course, you can see all of the wonderful products that we make at whistlekick.com. That's all for today. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.